You know how many stars there are in our business? Really outstanding men and women who work hard to give sales a good name? We've planned a year's worth of sound selling and hardly made a dent in the list of sales superstars who've agreed to talk to us about issues they consider important to their careers. In the months to come, you'll hear from Adele Sheely, Kerry Johnson, Jim Cathcart, Sheila Murray Bethel, Nathaniel Brandon, and Tony Alessandra. And we'll cover topics like actions to take to counter stress, using the support concept, dealing with price objections, how to turn a negative reaction into a positive sale, and so much more. You won't want to miss a single issue. Right, Roger? You bet, Clark. For instance, here's a superwoman and a super salesperson you'll want to know. She was six months pregnant with her fifth child when she started selling to supplement the family's income. It was the first real selling she'd done since she was eight years old, selling newspaper subscriptions in the neighborhoods of Chicago. Today, Daniel Kennedy is a self-made millionaire. In one year alone, she earned the title Six Million Dollar Woman by selling six million dollars worth of property in Southern California. Through the years, she's claimed honors and broken records, and today she's gained the respect of audiences worldwide. She's known in every English-speaking country as one of the foremost motivational seminar leaders on the circuit. And after you've listened to her speak, you'll know her reputation is well-deserved. Daniel Kennedy believes in a fast close, and she shows you how to make it work for you. And like Debbie Schneider and her taxi driver, Danielle has learned that you can't tell the book by its cover. Don't prejudge, or you might lose the sale. Here's Danielle Kennedy. The approach. Is it outstanding or obnoxious? In Sound Selling, we try to emphasize what I call the homegrown brand of interview. We never get a second chance to make a first impression. So first and foremost, we must look at our physical being and see how we are relating and communicating to the public without one spoken word. A lot of people say there's such a thing as body language, but does the body really have a language? Yes, it does. And as a matter of fact, it reminds me of when I walked into a very fashionable car showroom down in Palm Springs, California, about 10 years ago. I had a goal. I wanted to buy a brand new sports car, two-seater, inexpensive model for just myself to drive every now and then. In the showroom, there were also expensive cars, cars that went up past $100,000. When the salesperson got a glimpse of me pulling up with my triangle scarf around my head in a yellow Ford station wagon, five children hanging out of the window, I think he doubted my credibility as a client. I walked in and he had his arms folded and he looked at me as if to say, what are you doing here, darling? I said to him, I'd like to buy that yellow MG over in the corner. He said, well, do you think you can afford it? Immediately, I was put off by the salesperson. He had done something that's a real no-no. He had made a judgment about me regarding the way I looked and who I was with. Being the mother of many children and not really going out to the showroom to impress him, he thought I was not qualified to purchase this car. Sat down, he ran a credit report on me, and he was quite surprised that I could, in fact, purchase and qualify for that car. His initial reaction was, I don't think she can cut the mustard, based on the way I looked. Pair of shorts, top, triangle scarf, five kids hanging off behind me. First impressions. We have to watch how quickly we evaluate those clients and those customers based on what they look like and what they're wearing when they first walk in during the important approach. Ask yourself, is it outstanding or obnoxious? So we have a language, the customer and the client, and the salesperson has a language. We never get that second chance to make a first impression. When we first approach a customer or a client, it is very important to realize that they're coming to us at a different emotional tone. Sometimes their arms are crossed, they're just browsing around, looking. I have a theory, it's called the turtle theory. A lot of times when you look at a turtle, it's got its head under the shell. You don't go up to it and yank it out. A lot of salespeople try to do that with a client when they first walk in. Give them time to unfold. They're almost like a rosebud. A rosebud has to be watered and fertilized, and then it blossoms in front of us. That's exactly what happens between client and salesperson. Eye-to-eye -eye contact is another important facet of body language. Let's make sure if we're dealing with husbands and wives that we divide that eye contact up evenly between male and female. 
if we have a very beautiful salesperson out there working with a husband and wife and she just stares at the male, pretty soon there's going to be something wrong and no one's going to be quite sure. Wife is going to look to husband and say, you know, honey, I, I just feel kind of uncomfortable here. What she's really saying is, let's go down the street and work with an ugly saleswoman. Same thing with you gentlemen out there that are working with husbands and wives. Don't just look at the gentleman. Don't make it all boy talk, as if he was the financial genius in the family. She might be sitting there thinking, why isn't this creep looking at me? Doesn't he know the checkbook's in my purse? As a sales trainer and a speaker, I notice the first 15 minutes in my presentation is a time when I'm really approaching that public the same way I used to on one-on-one -on -one selling. Oftentimes, their arms are folded in the audience. They've got their legs kicked out into the aisle. They're sitting back, and the feeling is, impress me. Is it really going to be worth my time to sit here for the next four hours and listen to you? I have to work them in slowly. I have to get them involved. One of the first things that I say to them is, are you really here, both physically as well as mentally? I'm here physically and mentally for you. Are you here physically and mentally for me? It's very important to understand that we have to be in the present moment wherever we're at. A lot of people think that public speaking means that just the speaker has to be there physically as well as mentally. But I need you here physically as well as mentally also. I need your excitement, your energy, your enthusiasm, just as much as you need mine. So for the next five minutes, we're going to work on coming into the room together. And then I have them do things, exercises, like shaking five hands and thinking about one quality that they're really proud of and then to pass that quality on to the person next to them. The next thing you know, we're all in the room together. It's so important when we're working in a selling situation to make sure that everybody's there physically as well as mentally. Then we usually move on once we've kind of connected with their body language and that present moment thinking into questions. I have a philosophy. I think the questions should go from light and breezy to heavy and hard. Some of the light and breezy questions that I mention in my book, Supernatural Selling, are how many are in your family? What are some of your favorite hobbies? How did you and your spouse meet? This is a great question, a real favorite of mine. People love to talk about how they met and fell in love and think it's great that you sit there and listen so intently. But it really tells you a lot about the couple, who makes the stronger decisions, who has a more positive influence, What's the best time of day for me to call you is another excellent question during the approach. I hate to interrupt your activities. This shows them that you're considerate, plus you get to work with them without interruption. What do you and your wife do for a living? Always include both incomes. After all, 57% of our households in America today have double incomes. What's the most enjoyable part of your job? How long have you been searching for this product? What will you use this product for? When will you use the product most? Who in your organization will use this? Are you using a similar service now? These are light and breezy questions. Then we move forward to some heavier and harder questions. One of my favorite is, if we're fortunate enough today to strike exactly the correct note between us on what you need, will you be in a position to proceed to make a decision regarding this product? There's a couple of how-to tips that we have to be aware of during the interview process, what I call the homegrown brand of interview. The first tip is, we've got to follow the old golden rule. An important aspect of the interview is remembering that silence is golden. I have seen salespeople go on and on, not realizing that people were already sold on the product. The next thing you know, in the course of this unnecessary conversation, the salesperson talks everyone out of the sale. Let's take clothing, for instance. A lady comes into a store and sees a fur jacket she loves. She tries it on. Based on all the interviewing and need determination, the salesperson is aware that this customer can afford it. But the salesperson refuses to close and ask for the order. Oh, that coat looks striking on you. It's just the right color and so smart, so chic. Some people think furs are a waste of money out here in California, unless you travel a lot, but I can't imagine not owning one. Bong. She just blew it. The lady starts thinking, wow, I wonder how much I will use this. Will my husband think it's a waste? Lots of self-doubting questions arise because the salesperson did something she didn't have a right to do. Give an opinion when no one asked for one. No one cares. Most of the time, this is nervous talk on the part of the salesperson. This comes out because we find ourselves in a position of babbling for two reasons. Number one, we hate pregnant pauses and feel like talking will take the discomfort away. And number two, we are avoiding asking for the order. 
Talking is an avoidance behavior when we're afraid to ask. When great enthusiasm is generated by the customer, don't say too much, but definitely encourage them. They're having fun. Don't take the fun out of it. Do you know some salespeople feel so guilty about spending money on themselves in their own personal life that they transfer it to their customers? Boy, would I love a coat just like that if I could afford it. I've actually heard a salesperson say that to a customer. That really takes the fun out of buying the coat. The customer is thinking, who is this waiting on me, my mother? Become comfortable with silence. Sit back and watch the customer bask in the coat. Then add, it's so smart on you. It brings out the natural glow of your skin color. Say honest and sincere observations and sense when the timing is right and begin weaving into closing questions. The temperature is due to drop even further tonight. Can you picture yourself wearing this to the Notre Dame game this weekend? Then I think one of the other tips that we have to follow during this homegrown brand of interview is keep in mind that the customer always must look good. The customer is never wrong. Officer O'Malley is right because he's a police officer and he just checked his radar and somebody was going 15 miles over the speed limit. In this case, the customer is wrong and O'Malley is writing up the order. But you and I aren't cops. The customers are never wrong. If they're buying from you, don't argue. Let's take the lady with the coat again. Say she's rambling on about this coat saying, I love chinchilla, I love chinchilla. You very nicely say, this is lamb. She continues on about how wrong you are. Do not argue with her. Say this, I might have misread the manufacturer's label. Let me check with my manager because I'd feel terrible if you were buying a chinchilla and it's a lamb. Or I'd feel miserable if what I was telling you was wrong because I didn't study my inventory enough before displaying it. You know this is lamb because you're a supernatural and the product is indelibly marked on your brain. But don't come across that way or you'll make the customer feel wrong. And that ain't right. Unless you want to join Officer O'Malley's force, they're always looking for some good policemen. Isn't Danielle fantastic? When she comes back, she'll talk about picking up hints the customer drops. But first, every salesman agrees how humor can be all important. Often, it's the funny story that breaks the ice. Every month, we'll feature a joke that one of you has submitted. This joke of the month was sent in by Irv Clausen, the owner of Clausen Painting Contractors in Richmond, Virginia. Irv's a great golfer and collects golfing stories. I love this one. Sales manager's a passionate golfer, but his wife resents his playing on Sunday. Naturally, it's their one day to be together. So one Sunday morning, the guy sneaks over to the club at 6 o'clock, bright and early, and gets in 18 holes before breakfast. So far, so good. Now, that afternoon, sitting in his living room, twiddling his thumbs, reading the Sunday paper, his wife is preparing Sunday dinner, and the guy can't stand it anymore. Finally, he says, um, you wouldn't mind if I squeezed in nine holes before dinner, would you, dear? Well, she gives him the wifely glare. Finally, he says, okay, as long as you're back in two hours. So he takes off like a shot, rushes to the club, gets in the nine holes. He's coming across the parking lot after he finishes when he sees a woman member with a flat tire. Now, she also happens to be one of his best customers. Well, what could he do? He helped her change the tire, and she said, hey, look, you can't go home all dirty like that. I live in a condo just over there. Why don't you come back to my place and you can clean up? She says, okay. So at her condo, she said, look, why don't you slip into the shower and I'll clean up your clothes for you? So he does, comes out of the shower, there she stands in a black negligee, martini in her hand, and he's two hours late getting home. Well, his wife yells at him, where have you been? The dinner's ruined. And he said, look, I played nine holes at the club. As I was coming across the parking lot, I saw this woman with a flat tire. She offered to let me clean up at her place. And as I was coming out of the shower, there she was standing there wearing a black negligee with a martini in her hand. There's this long, deadly silence. And then his wife said, you're lying to me. You played 18 holes, didn't you? <laughs> you try using that excuse at your house, and you'll know why this is a joke. Don't forget us the next time you hear a good joke. <laughs> Just keep it clean. Send your joke to Sound Selling, 7300 North Lehigh, Chicago, Illinois, 60648, and we'll give you credit when we use it in a later program. Danielle Kennedy hasn't gotten as far as she has without perfecting the salesperson's most effective technique, 
a surefire close. But before you can use the close, you have to prepare the customer during a homegrown interview. Let her tell you about it. During the course of the interview, salespeople often miss some cues from their customers. They're asking all the right questions, which is good. They know their product line well. Let's think about the insurance salesperson for a moment. Maybe this particular insurance person is a broker and can handle several different brands of insurance. But due to a higher commission split on one of the companies that he brokers for, he tends to push that company more to his customer. This new customer has always used land life insurance and is really not dissatisfied with the insurance, but rather is dissatisfied with the land life agent and decides to move on. But the new agent is losing the customer because the customer doesn't want to change insurance companies. They just want a more expensive policy and a new agent. They almost feel as if they will hurt this new salesperson's feelings if they do get land life insurance again. The salesperson says, of course I can handle getting you a new land life policy, but if you looked into beauty life, beauty life is a few cents more, but listen to the advantages. The customer may listen and then say, well, we'll get back to you. They almost feel obligated to buy beauty life from this agent because the agent is so high on the stuff. So rather than hurt the salesperson's feelings, they say, we'll get back to you. What they're really intending to do is search for another agent who will shut up and write the policy that they want. What do you do as a salesperson? If out of good conscience you prefer selling beauty life because it's a better policy, you may want to try my true confessions or honesty script. Here goes. I know, Mr. Customer, you want to stick to land life, but let me point out beauty life. However, if you still feel confident with land life, after my presentation, then I'll be happy to handle it for you. Now the same thing happens if you're picking out several products to show a customer, but you don't have them all available to show. Say something like this, these are the things I've selected for you to look at, but if what you want isn't here, I can get it for you quickly. Say things like, I can change my game plan at a minute's notice, or I can jump on this today if we don't find what you want. This instills loyalty and won't allow the customer to think that these are the only products you have and like. Therefore, if he doesn't say he likes them, he won't hurt your feelings. Some customers are so nice that they will not say one word. They will even act as if they liked your product. They will say, well, we'll get back to you. Then they'll go by elsewhere because they didn't want to confront you or hurt your feelings. Remember, they are buying, not you. Let them know that if you didn't hit on what they wanted today, you have more resources to tap. Hang in there with me, Mr. and Mrs. Customer. Also tell them to be honest with you. If what I've selected doesn't meet your needs, please tell me. I can change my game plan at a moment's notice. I know the business. It instills loyalty and honesty on the customer's part. As you are building rapport during the interview process, keep in mind that third-party selling is critically important. If these people have been referred to you from someone who has a great deal of credibility in their life, I would like you to use what I call my double responsibility script. The moment of connection when we first meet the client and during the course of the interview, it's important to say to them, first of all, how much we appreciate the fact that they did come to us. They had a choice of 10 million other salespeople for this product, but we so appreciate the fact that they came to us based on Mr. and Mrs. Mentor's referral. Then the second thing that we do is, we say we have a double responsibility now. I have to do a good job, not only for your sake, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, but for Mr. and Mrs. Mentor's sake, because their name and reputation are on the line. And if I don't take good care of you, I'm going to be in real trouble with them. I'll be checking back with them and keeping them posted on what's going on during the course of our time together. This makes the client, the customer, feel very, very important. They understand that you have credibility in somebody's eyes that is not in sales, that is not working with this product. And 50% of the defense barriers are down early in the interview when the double responsibility script and third-party selling is used. Another great question to ask during the interview process is the high school question, particularly when you need to get a lot of background about your client or customer. Tell me what you've been doing since high school. It's amazing what you'll find out during an interview with a question like that. Isn't she dynamic? And like all good salespeople, she wants to keep the dialogue going. She'd like to hear from you directly. And it's easy to contact her, Roger. If you have questions or want more information on her book and video, write to Danielle Kennedy International Productions, Post Office Box 4382, San Clemente, California, 92672.
I wonder if when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he ever imagined someone using it with the skill George Walter does. George is one of the greatest proponents of the telephone that I've ever known. He's the author of the book and audio cassette program, Phone Power. He works with companies on how best to utilize that all-important tool found on every desk, the tool we take most for granted, the telephone. On this month's Phone Power feature, George Walther has an idea that'll make the telephone a more efficient part of your workday. Here's George Walther with the sound-selling Phone Power Tip of the Month. Salespeople often make appointments with prospects and later find that they wasted their time because the prospects weren't truly qualified. In fact, most sales managers readily agree that nearly two-thirds of all face-to-face -face sales visits should never have taken place. It turns out that the prospective customer wasn't really a prospective customer. Either he lacked the decision authority, the serious interest, or the resources to buy the product or service being discussed. Your time is far too valuable to use talking with unqualified prospects. But there's an even more important reason to carefully qualify prospects, and that is your responsibility to your best and your potential best customers. There are loads of people who may be willing to sit down with a salesperson, even if they aren't serious prospects. But there's also a large number of people who really would come out ahead by talking with you if they only had the chance. They'd be in the position to follow through and buy, and that would leave both you and your customer better off. Since your time is limited and you can't talk with all those valid potential customers, you are, in effect, ripping them off when you use your time to meet with someone who's not a qualified buyer. So, use the telephone to qualify every appointment before you make a costly personal visit. Help that prospective customer. Make the call simple and effective by structuring multiple choice questions in advance. Link your questions to the qualification categories that are meaningful to you and let the prospect, in effect, choose how much attention he should get. For example, if you sell college biology textbooks to campus bookstores and want to qualify a specific store's potential for ordering the book, it's best to ask a question like this. Considering your projected enrollment and course schedule, how many of these new textbooks do you expect to order over the next 12 months? Fewer than 200, between 2 and 500, or more than 500? The salesman might simply have asked how many books the store planned to use during the year. But the customer is usually best served when he's offered a very simple way to do things. Answering a multiple choice question is easier for your prospect and yields more valuable information for you, too. Of course, in your organization, you may have many categories of accounts based on the customer's answers to those multiple choice questions. To help you properly categorize your customers, be sure your questions cover the five critical qualifying areas. They include time, quantity, frequency, type, and influence. A time-oriented multiple choice question determines just how pressing the prospect's need is. Are you planning to go ahead with this expansion in the next three months, uh, sometime before the end of the year, or is the project just in the loose planning stages at this point? Quantity questions make it easy for you to determine if the customer is likely to need very frequent personal contact or may be best handled on an infrequent basis. Within your department in a typical month, do various individuals order fewer than 50 diskettes, between 50 and 150, or more than 150? Frequency is a question area that's certainly appropriate if your product line includes consumable items. An office supply dealer wants to know not just how large the initial order will be, but how often paper and supplies will be purchased in the future. When asking about type, your aim is to see if there's a good fit between what your prospect needs and what you offer. John, when you work with recruiters to fill sensitive positions, are you generally searching for top management candidates, data processing people, or general clerical staff? The question of authority helps you determine the degree of influence your prospect has on the final purchase decision. This is best established right up front. Mr. Cowan, is this a decision that you will make personally, or is there an approval committee involved? Once you've asked a series of concise qualifying questions, you have a pretty good idea whether this prospect truly is in a position to benefit from your product or service. Create those multiple choice questions and then analyze the answers. 
assemble a profile of prospect categories based on the answers to the questions. You could call this your decision tree. Visualize a tree with a series of branching limbs. Each of the multiple choice questions you ask represents a fork in the branch. Each of the prospect's answers should guide you toward another in your series of questions. And where you end up on that branch should dictate what level of attention you'll be dedicating to this individual. Is he or she somebody you want to visit immediately? Or is this someone you simply want to keep warm by making a monthly courtesy telephone contact? Or perhaps it's somebody who really doesn't have a significant potential, and you'll simply send a thank you note and update your mailing list. But don't wait to qualify your customer face to face. There's no commodity so valuable to you as your prime selling time. Wasting any of it on an unqualified prospect hurts you and your potential best customer. I'm George Walther. More phone power to you. That was George Walther with a sound selling phone power tip of the month. One thing we all have to think about, whether we're on the phone or across the desk, is how we sound to the customer. On side four, Dorothy Leeds will be bringing us communication techniques in her monthly Power Speak segment. But to close out side three, Daniel Kennedy has a word to say on the importance of regional accents. About 22 years ago, I relocated from Chicago, Illinois, to Orange County, California. I didn't realize it, but half of Chicago had already moved out there before me. When I got into selling, I found that my Midwestern background was a real asset. You sound like you're from the Midwest, are you? Of course, I knew they were because the Midwestern accent is very distinguishable. Now, I want to mention why we ask that question. Have you ever heard of the word affinity? The dictionary calls it a likingness. You are drawn to something when you have an affinity for something or someone. There are degrees of affinity. Some people seem to have a natural affinity towards certain people, groups, or locations. I'm from Chicago by birth. I lived in Chicago for 19 years. I think the people from the Midwest have great personalities, wonderful accents, and go to the best restaurants because I love Chicago cooking. Maybe I'm a little biased. When I first started my selling career in California, I was interviewing and asking clients questions, and I kept picking up Midwestern accents because there were so many transplants out there. I'd say, well, gee, how long have you lived in this area? What do you think of this product so far? I was chatting with them, and I'd pick up the accent, and I'd say, boy, sure sounds like you're from the Midwest. And they'd say, I am. And I'd say, whereabouts? And they'd say, Chicago. I'd say, no kidding. I'm from Chicago, too. The Me Too is a great way to build rapport during the asking question stage of getting to know one another. Down goes the defense barriers. Why? Because we have a natural affinity towards one another. We were born in the same area, affected by similar values, and we seem to agree faster on things due to our viewpoint. Notice on television how commercials try to show you that their product is okay because certain groups who have a natural affinity towards each other use it. For example, baseball players. A lot of people identify with baseball players. They're all regular, all-American guys. You see baseball players you know and like and identify with, drinking a certain kind of beer, you say to yourself, this beer must be good. People are influenced like that. You're from Chicago, I'm from Chicago. I'm okay, you're okay. With this natural affinity going for us, it's easier to ask questions and receive answers to these questions. There's a lot of things we can scan for in order to build affinity with people. Places we were born, accents, children, clubs, sports, situations, including divorcees, single parents, age, retirement areas, pregnancy. Have you ever noticed there's a lot of pregnant women that hang around together? I couldn't believe it when I was selling real estate in California. For about six months straight there during my pregnancy, half my clientele were pregnant. Have you ever seen just one pregnant woman going down the street? Hardly ever. There's a natural attraction towards some people more than others. Why not be aware of that in your selling endeavors? People say opposites attract. My feeling is not for long. Likes attract likes. If you find yourself selling your stuff to people who sometimes sound like you, think like you, and have the same sense of humor as you, don't fight it. Isn't selling more workable when we can say, me too? On side four, we're going to hear about the 12 most persuasive words you'll need if you're going to be a power speaker. And we'll hear from a real power speaker, the inimitable Zig Ziglar.
Do you think of yourself as a public speaker? Many times we forget how important one's speaking ability is. Just because we're not called upon to stand up before an audience, each of us still must communicate with the prospect we're trying to sell. And that communication can be easier if we just remember 12 magic words. We'll learn what the words are and why they work from business consultant Dorothy Leeds. Dorothy has an impressive list of corporate clients that includes some of the best-known companies in the country. She's trained more than 20,000 business leaders in her results-oriented sales and management learning programs. Her book, Smart Questions, quickly became a highly acclaimed bestseller. But let's get back to those 12 all-important words. Here's Dorothy Leeds with this month's Power Speak Tip. The 12 most persuasive words and other influential techniques. I have a fantastic new discovery to share with you. The results have been proven. Here is an easy way to improve your love life, keep you safe from worry, and bring you health and happiness. And it is guaranteed to save you money. Got your attention, didn't I? And I'm halfway to selling you right now, before I even mention what my product is. Why? Because I used the 12 most persuasive words in the English language. And here they are. Number one, discovery. It takes us back to our childhood. And we are excited to share our discoveries with anyone who will listen. Think how excited you get about the great new restaurant you've discovered, or the super sales rep you just interviewed. Discovery is exciting, and it adds adventure to our lives. Number two is the word easy. We are all basically lazy, and will look for a quick, uncomplicated answer. The success of the one-minute manager is ample proof of this. Number three, guarantee. We are all reluctant to try something new because of the risk involved. Take away that fear by guaranteeing a sure thing and... You've got a sale. Number four, health. Good for your health or bad for your health, self-preservation is a great motivator. We naturally gravitate towards anything that will improve our condition and make us generally feel better. Number five, love. The one thing we can't do without and the one word that evokes all kinds of romantic fantasies. Associate this with your product or service and the sale is made for you. Number six, money. Everyone reacts perceptibly at the thought of a new way to make or save money. This is a good way to pique clients' interest right from the start. Number seven, new. The idea of something new is appealing to many people. Just visualize the smell and feel of a new car. Number eight, proven. We're back to the no risk factor here. Proven means that it is already tested and we have been given the go ahead. Number nine, results. This is the bottom line. We want to know what we will get or what will happen if we purchase this product or go on this diet or hire you to do a job. Number 10, safety. Most of us value our lives and wish to be safe from harm. Unless you've got a death wish, the idea of safety is very comforting. Number 11, save. At one time or another, everyone has heard a good friend or relative boast about the great buy they just got on a new gadget or household appliance. Even the wealthiest people shop for bargains. I've seen mature adults go wild at the thought of saving money. Saving time and effort are also very persuasive. And number 12 is the word you. Everyone is motivated by their own self-interest. Since you always persuade more through personalizing your approach, use the word you. Avoid statements like, the client will say, or it has been noticed. Much, much better to say, you will say, you will notice. Personalize your language and you will have customers in the palm of your hand. The 12 most persuasive words. Discovery, easy, guarantee, Health, love, money, new, proven, results, safety, 
save, and you. And remember the power of the active voice. What does active mean? The active voice relies on verbs. The boy ran is much more powerful than the boy was seen running. The active voice has a clear subject, and that subject is usually you. That means that you take the responsibility. For example, I saw or I believe. The passive impersonal, it has been seen that, rather than I saw, may remove you from the line of fire, but it makes for a boring speech. I guarantee it. You've heard another power speak tip with communications expert Dorothy Leeds. If you want more information on becoming a powerful speaker, you'll want to hear Dorothy Leeds audio cassette program Power Speak and read her new book Power Speak: The Complete Guide to Persuasion, Public Speaking, and Presenting. For information, you can write to Dorothy at Organizational Technologies, 800 West End Avenue, New York 10025. Her phone number is area code 212-864-2424. I can't think of a better motivator, sales trainer, and speaker than the irrepressible Zig Ziglar. Zig started out selling cookware door to door. He knows the pleasures, the perils, and frustrations of a sales career. Today, he crisscrosses the country, speaking to groups of all kinds. He's written four books, including the bestseller, See You at the Top. It's been translated into Spanish, French, and Korean, and there are more than 1,500,000 copies in print. That makes it a bestseller in anybody's language. Zig's message is a good one for all of us to remember. He'll sell you on the fact that attitude will make all the difference in your sales. If you're an old friend of the Ziggler style, prepare to hear it at its best. If this is your first Zig experience, you're in for a special treat. His material is as current as this morning's newspaper, and he brought along a bag full of his down-to-earth examples and a healthy serving of his good old-fashioned humor. Let's sit in on a seminar and hear the master motivator in action. might come as a surprise to you when I say this, but the thing us salespeople ought to get the most excited about actually are objections. Because you see, if there were no objections to begin with, there'd be no need for us as salespeople. People would just go ahead and buy everything and we would be out of the picture. One of the most important aspects of selling is dealing with those objections. To begin with, let's understand the basic difference between a question and an objection. A question simply means they're seeking information. How long will it take for delivery? What colors does this come in? Actually, a person who raises an objection is looking for encouragement. They are saying, I have an interest in this, and I want you to give me some encouragement about the way I can end up owning what you are selling. No objections and no interest, I think, would go together without any doubt. Some basics about objections are simply these. Objections are our friends. They clearly say to us as salespeople, yes, I am interested in what you are selling. Uh, you don't have to answer all objections. Now, that's the first thing that I want to make clear. For example, the suit of clothes I have on. I did not like all of the things about the suit. There are two things, as a matter of fact, I didn't like about it, and yet I bought the suit. Now, what are the two things I didn't like? Well, I wasn't overly excited about the price. I'll just have to fess up going in. I wasn't. And the second thing I didn't like about it was the fact that I have to wear a belt. I prefer the other kind. But my wife told me it was a nice fit and that the color went well with me. She said, honey, I like it. All objections were overcome. I bought the suit. Now, the third thing about objections is the fact that approximately 90% of them will be the same when you're out in the world of selling. 
And really, what you need in many cases is a new presentation or a more conclusive or inclusive presentation because if the same one keeps coming up, it really does indicate that you're not doing enough selling in the presentation itself. Now, let me say this as point number four. There's a formula which fits in most cases, and you can adapt this formula and follow the formula in handling objections. However, we need to remember that there are many different kinds of prospects, many different kinds. You have the animal prospect who's going to bear it in mind, the insomniac prospect who's going to sleep on it, the musical prospect who will make a note of it, and the playful prospect who's just feeling out the market. Yeah, well, we've got a lot of different ones. Now, the thing I believe we need to clearly understand is that all prospects, regardless of what kind they are, have two basic things in common. Number one, they want to be right. Now, salespeople, you can relate to that. You know you want to be right. And number two, all of us will relate to also, the prospect really wants to be understood. Now, there are four times and opportunities to handle objections. The first is before they occur. The second time is when they occur. The third time is later on in the presentation. And the fourth time is never. Some objections just simply should never be given any credibility at all. By far, the most effective place to handle an objection is before it occurs. When the same one keeps coming up, as I said a moment ago, you need to reorganize that presentation. Many years ago, a man named Harry Lemons, who was the inventor of this particular machine, taught me a couple of things that I was really excited about. I used to demonstrate these things at the state fairs and on television. When I turned that crank, that food would come tumbling out, and we really could make it do tricks. We could make that machine talk, cutting those fresh vegetables. Invariably, we encountered two major objections. I'd be right in the middle of the demonstration, and some member of the group there, a lady generally, because they'd be the ones who would end up using it at home, would ask me, Mr. Ziegler, if I bought that machine, could I use it like you use it? I'd always look at her, and I'd smile, and I'd say, no, ma'am, there's no way that you will ever be able to use this machine like I use it. Now, you might think that's a strange thing for me to say, but I did it for a couple of reasons. Number one, I was telling her the truth. I don't believe there's a housewife in 10,000 who could ever learn to use that machine as I did, and I explained why. Basically, they've got 101 other things to do. They're going to use it two or three or four times a week. I was using it several hours every single day. It's not likely that they could do with it what I could do. Now, I would have answered it that far, but how many machines would I have sold if I'd stopped it right there? I wanted to sell machines, so here's what I answered with in the presentation. I'd say, no, ma'am, you could never use it like I do because you have so many other things to do. But let me tell you how effectively you can use it. The machine comes with an instruction book, and I can give you this book right now. And if you will spend five minutes reading the book, I can give the sharpest knives available to these three ladies. And in five minutes' time with this machine, you can cut more food better and faster than all three of these ladies combined with the knives. You've never used the machine. They've been using knives all of their lives. But you could cut more with the machine, not because you're an expert with the machine, but because you have the machine which does the job. And that's what you really want, isn't it? And I would use that also as a trial close right there. And then as you can see, we have five blades. One blade is on the machine and there are four other blades and it'll do an awful lot of things. I would demonstrate one of the blades and then when I finished demonstrating the first blade, I'd use another trial close. I would have cut about seven or eight foods and I'd say, as you can see, we only have used one blade and we've cut all of this beautiful food. Now, ladies, let me ask you, if the machine only had one blade, how many of you already feel that's something that you really want to have in your home. Can I see your hands? And I would get my best prospects immediately right there. 
then I would demonstrate the rest of the blades. Now, the second objection that would often come up, and I'd be demonstrating, I would bring this up myself. I'd say a lot of times I've had people ask me, Mr. Ziegler, if I bought that machine, could I cut my hand on it? And I'd always kind of grin, and I'd say, yes, ma'am, but now we don't recommend it. <laughs> But if that's really what you want to do, it's a very simple procedure. All it takes is coordination. You insert the finger as you turn the crank. Now, get it straight. Insert finger, turn crank, and when you do the red, comes out right here. <laughs> now, if you don't want to cut your hand, keep it out of the machine. Now, what is this doing? You're selling on the offense. Your believability is greater if you handle the objections in the body of the presentation. Otherwise, you are apparently defending instead of selling on the offense. Now, regardless of the kind of prospect, if the objection occurs during the presentation, there are some basics you can follow, especially on the first objection. And it's appropriate to answer it at that point. A lot of times, it's not appropriate. But if it is appropriate and they bring it up at that point. For example, you might be demonstrating tires or something. The prospect might say, well, I don't believe these tires are rugged enough for our use. Now, what do you do there? Well, number one, you hear the objection out. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, put it this way, he who answereth the matter before he hears it is not wise. Let them get the objection out. Now, number two, you act pleased that they brought it up. Objections thrive on opposition, but they die with agreement. I'm really glad that you raised that issue. Don't use the word objection. Raise that issue. And you truly should be because that says I'm interested. Then number three, you change the objection to a question. Your question, as I understand it, is will these tires hold up under the day-to-day -day pounding our city streets will give them? Is that what you're asking? That way you get the customer involved. Then number four, you need to get the commitment that this is the only question. Mr. Prospect, is this the only question you have? Which stands between you and ownership of these tires, or would there be something else? You obviously wait for the answer. Then number five, you use the question, objection, as the reason for going ahead. Actually, Mr. Prospect, you say, the question you raise is the reason we do so much business in this city. Fleet test after fleet test firmly established the fact that our super reinforced steel belted radials with Durabrig are ideally suited for rugged city street usage. As a matter of fact, that's the very reason that XYZ company. And then you take step number five. And what is step number five? You bring up why this company used it, you parade your testimonials, and you close the sale at that point. Now, if the prospect brings up another objection after you've completed your presentation, handle it in the same manner. But if they bring up yet another objection, you respond with a question. Mr. Prospect, do you mind if I ask you a question? And you get their answer. Then the question is, is this the only question which stands between you and a favorable decision concerning our product, or would there be something else? If that's the only other question, you answer it, you assume the sale, and you attempt to close. But if the prospect says, well, I'm also concerned about, and they start bringing other things out, then what you do is you take your talking pad, and whatever the objection might be, it might be price, you write it down, it might be they don't know that much about your company, it might be the guarantee, you write them down, then you simply say, are these the only objections? You deal with them one at a time, and as you deal with them, you simply say, is that a satisfactory answer to your question, and then you cross them out. Does that clarify the issue to your satisfaction uh, would be another way of putting it. Now, as you cross them out, when you've got them all crossed out, then subliminally what you have said there with that little bit of demonstration is that I've eliminated any reason for you not owning the product. Now, therefore, it behooves you. You, in essence, have said, I want to go ahead and do business with you. We need to, as salespeople understand this, the prospect wants to say yes. Now, I know that might surprise some of you, especially if you've had a half dozen no's in a row. Uh, they really do want to say yes. And one of the reasons is because no is so final. And you know, there's something about 
us people that makes us want to not totally terminate any relationship unless it is a bad one. And if you've been acting in a professional manner, they really do want to say yes. And then there's a second reason why they want to say yes if they don't say yes to you. And there's a need for this or a similar product. What he's going to have to do is talk to another salesperson. In our company, for example, a lot of times we have certain needs, and it is our hope, and I know on occasion we have bought, though we had not answered or had all of our objections answered, but we had looked and looked to find, and the comment would be made, well, you know, we got to go through it again. And I've thought about that a lot. They really do want to do business. Most of your prospects do. They want to say yes. Now, some objections that you encounter are better to answer on a later basis. You might be demonstrating one feature, and they ask something entirely unrelated. And then what you do, unless it's a one-word answer, if you can answer it in one word, I would suggest you go ahead and do it, even if it's just a sentence or so. Now, the exception to that, that I would include that, would be with the exception of when they bring up price it might not be appropriate to answer it right at that moment. But whatever the other objection might be that you don't want to handle, you simply say, well, you know, that's a very exciting feature of our product, and you are going to be delighted when I get to that point. But if you don't mind, let me pursue this because we're at such a critical area that I need to tie some things which are very relevant, but I promise to get back to it. And if I neglect to do that, would you remind me of it? But don't you forget, as a matter of fact, if you're wise on your talking pad, you will scratch a little note so they can see that you're not trying to put them off, that you really do want to answer them. Now, what you need to do is plan ahead. And when I say plan ahead, you should memorize a lot of ways to say the same thing. And the reason you want to do that is you memorize them, you will come to realize there are a lot of ways to say the same thing, but there's only one way to say it the best. Find out what that best way is and stay with it. Again, what you do when they bring up the objection, you do not want to answer right then, you act pleased. You get permission to delay. And if you don't mind, I'd like to answer that question in a moment. And I promise to do exactly that. Keep that promise. Then you close that little bit down by saying, is that fair enough? amazing thing about that little question, is that fair enough? Interestingly enough, everybody basically wants to be fair. And so when you say, is that fair enough? I give you permission. And then to repeat myself, be sure you do exactly that. Now, some objections are not meant to be answered. So you just kind of smile and ignore them. But if the question comes up again, regardless of how absurd it sounds, you then deal with it. Now, here's something we need to understand. You're not in the sales answering objection business. You're in sales business. I have been on a call on many occasions where I was training another salesperson, and I would watch that salesperson answer an objection. And then they would, in essence, fold their arms and say, well, I handled that one pretty good. Go ahead, shoot another one at me. I'll take care of it, too. Go ahead, challenge me. That's crazy. You answer the objections, then you close. Now, sometimes selling involves simple little analogies, or it involves just asking for the order. I'm thinking of a friend of mine named Randy Cooper up in Enid, Oklahoma, runs a furniture store. Randy told me that he'd been listening to our tapes and where I used a couple of examples, and he was able to translate them and utilize them with a slight alteration to fit his business perfectly. He was telling me about this lady who came in for a reclining chair. Her husband was getting it for her as a Christmas present and had sent her down to the store to pick it out. She had brought her teenage daughter along with it, found exactly the chair she wanted. It was $449.95. She loved it. And she said to uh, Randy, I'll go home and uh, talk to my husband. And Randy said, you know, I just remembered something I'd heard. And he said, so I kind of looked at it and said, I have two children and I keep them three and four days a week. My grocery bill runs about $100 a week. Lady said, well, there are three of us, and that's about what my grocery bill runs. Randy said, you know, I'd almost bet you that you never really talk to your husband about that grocery bill. You just go ahead and buy the groceries, don't you? She said, yeah. 
And I said, you know, and, and he said, you know, interestingly enough, $100 a week is over $5,000 a year. You never ask your husband about the $5,000. He's anxious for you to have this. He's giving it to you. Do you really want to go home and talk to him about it? Randy said the lady looked down at her teenage daughter and said, I'll take it. <laughs> A simple little analogy. I close with this. The sales professional is like a football player. The sales professional is one who is interested in running to daylight. He understands very thoroughly that he can have all the prospects he wants. He can get all the appointments he wants. He can make all of the presentations he wants, but until he takes advantage and capitalizes on closing opportunities, that he is never going to be successful in the world of selling. I've had it said so many times by a lot of salespeople. They'll come to me and say, you know, I can do everything but close. I mean, I know how to get prospects. I know how to set up appointments. I know how to handle objections. I can do everything but close. Well, what they're really saying is, I don't know how to sell. Because until you close, you're nothing but a conversationalist. So you need to know how to handle these objections and use them as a closing opportunity. The support material to go with all of this is so critically important. That's the reason we as professionals need to read and to listen and to study. One of the secrets of successful selling is the professional is always on the grow. Be a pro and grow. That's important to build a sales career. Thank you. You can have a second helping of Zig by calling the 800 number you'll find on this cassette label. We'll direct you to more cassettes by this special salesperson. All too soon, it's time to close the cover on this month's edition of Sound Selling. We'll have more solid sales ideas coming your way next month and in the months to come. We have new features planned. We have a galaxy of guests who will bring you the latest news in sales techniques and trends. On next month's edition, we'll hear from Canada's top flight sales trainer, Bill Gibson, who'll discuss how we have to break out of our comfort zone if we're going to hit the top. We'll learn how to handle failure from Dennis Waitley. And Mike Wickett will talk about using hard evidence to overcome a prospect's initial doubts. And the dynamic Patricia Fripp will give us her ideas on networking and how to be remembered. And she'd be memorable even if we didn't share an English accent. Of course, George Walther and Dorothy Leeds and Michael LaBeouf will join us with their tips to improve your performance. The other star of Sound Selling could be you. So please send us your sale of the month story or a great joke you've heard. Or tell us about the unsung salesperson who you've found most inspiring. Remember, this is your publication, just as much as it is ours. That's what sales is all about, communication between people who trust each other. Until next month, this is Roger Dawson. I hope that the month ahead will be your greatest sales month ever and that sound selling will help you make it happen. We hope you've enjoyed sound selling. For more information on any of the guest speakers on these cassettes, simply call sound selling at 1-800-323-5552 or write to us at Nightingale Conan Corporation, 7300 North Lehigh, Chicago, Illinois, 60648. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope you'll keep listening to us. This is Clark Weber. Have a great month.